have to make sure that the microphone works because yesterday during decarbonization day, at important points, somehow the microphone stopped to work, so I have to make sure. Um, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, I hope some of you are here. Um, this afternoon, we have really, uh, for me personally, <laughs> a real personal, um, long-awaited visit by Kristalina uh, Georgieva, the managing director of the IMF. Um, but our story goes back a long time ago when we were both at the World Bank and Kristalina was pretty much the go-to person for environmental issues for the whole World Bank at the time. And she had to, we sort of started to get to know each other actually when she had to really step in on a very delicate uh, environmental issue related to a program in China at the time. Um, that's about 20 years ago. Um, and thereafter, we were very, I, at least I was fortunate, but you can ask Kristalina, to uh, directly work together because uh, Kristalina was then the uh, director of the, uh, for, the, for the Russian Federation, resident in Moscow. And just at the time, it was you know, around 2006, 7, 8, just at the time when Russia really started at that time to emerge as, uh, as a G8 member that was really willing to start embarking on Russian aid, international ODA. So, uh, Kristalina also spearheaded the whole collaboration and cooperation program there. Um, and thereafter, uh, our management at the World Bank, President tapped her indeed to become what you would call here the corporate secretary interface with the, with the board and in particular with the shareholders, which then led to another important job a few years later with the European Commission. And uh, Kristalina was then, um, this is about 12 years ago, I think around that time, um, she was uh, tapped to be the vice president of the European Commission and the commissioner for, first for human resources and budget, for those who want to know, but then most importantly for all the emergency aid and humanitarian aid of the European Commission. And you can imagine what a vast uh, portfolio it was. Um, then she came back to the World Bank and uh, as um, really a part of the top team, management team, and uh, also was for, for a period of time acting president, but then also became uh, chief executive of the World Bank. And I think in 2019, moved over to the IMF, we always say moving over or moving between, or so between World Bank and IMF. And uh, she has been uh, the managing director for the last four years now. But it's a managing director with a twist, I should say, because as her background indicates, you know, and actually it was quite funny this morning at the Astana International Forum, you, know, you all know Richard Quest? Okay, Richard Quest from CNN, he was sort of the moderator, and she says, whenever there's a debt crisis in the world, we know the IMF will be there. Whenever there's a you know, balance of payment and other macro issues, we know she will be there. And, so, and then she started to, but you may not know, when we talk about climate change or green growth and how to green development, well, Kristalina will also be there to, to speak. And it's, I think, uh, fitting that today's lecture is titled, and I, might, I want to make sure that I'm not going to, you know, do injustice to the title. So it's uh, Paving the Way to More Resilient 
inclusive and greener economies in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Right? So it is our immediate neighborhood that we are concerned about. Um, I just want to link it also that uh, SDGs and in particular SDG 13, which re relates to climate action and of course all the issues related to climate change itself have been actually a uh, topic of recent conferences here. So we just had the first SDSN, the so uh, Sustainable Development uh, Support Network Kazakhstan conference uh, at the end of, of May. Now there are 25 institutions that participate, so it's fast growing. And there, I must say, uh, the contributions of our, our and other students really were the highlight for me of that meeting. Um, yesterday, we had the French-Kazakh decarbonization day. So we speak, talk, you know, picked up the one particular topic of decarbonization, in particular in terms of collaboration between government, business, and academia. And it's, it was just the beginning of a long, what we hope will be long and fruitful dialogue. And so it's very fitting that today, Kristalina will talk about the, how to create a resilient or resilient economies that have to really deal with the challenge of making sure that we're going to have a future that our children and grandchildren will be proud of. Thank you, Kristalina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Shigeo. One thing Shigeo didn't say in his introduction is that he was my boss for a couple of years. <laughs> and uh, now that uh, he is not my boss anymore. I can say he was a good boss. Uh, my uh, great pleasure to be with you uh, today. Uh, I recognize uh, that this is graduation time, so the, to those who are here, uh, thank you for sparing uh, some time uh, uh, for our interaction. Uh, I love speaking to young people. And in Central Asia, there is plenty of them. You are the face of the tremendous promise this region holds. I also want to tell you that as someone who has worked in Central Asia in the 90s, I'm incredibly impressed by the transformation that has taken place uh, here and very touched that some things are just the same when we were flying over uh, what you call Altindala, over the golden uh, steps. They are so beautiful and there is so much that says we have been here for thousands of years, we will be here for thousands to come and hopefully we will do our best to protect that beauty. Um, in our institution, actually the same is at, at the World Bank, uh, we group countries in area departments and uh, Kazakhstan belongs to the Caucasus and Central Asia department, as Shigeo said, the five Central Asian countries plus Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. Uh, and I'm very glad that I'm coming to you the day we are issuing a paper that is dedicated to this group of countries and it looks into that golden promise they hold. And what are the reforms that can be undertaken for this promise to materialize? Uh, looking into the history of this uh, nations, they, you got independence in the early 90s, you have gone through a very dramatic transition 
As a Bulgarian, my country went through a very dramatic transition as well, and I know what it takes from policymakers and from ordinary people to get through these years of transformation, of transition. What was then so very uh, uh, impressive was the appetite for reforms. And we have seen reforms moving these economies from central planning to, to markets effectively and creating completely different environment for investments and growth. And growth was strong. But with time, we also have seen that the appetite for reform kind of weakened. We got somewhere, things are not so bad. Uh, and with slowing of reforms, growth is also slowing uh, down. This is never good, but it is particularly problematic when we are in a world that is being hit by a shock upon shock upon shock. We had pandemic, war, and then cost of living crisis um, that has affected uh, hundreds of millions of people quite uh, dramatically. What we learned very quickly in the first months of the pandemic, a simple, simple truth. Countries with strong fundamentals that relentlessly improve themselves withstand these shocks better than countries with weak fundamentals. Uh, the same way people with strong immune systems withstood the COVID virus better than people with weak uh, immune systems. And in that context, what I want to talk to you about is why it is so important that there is a renewed energy, new momentum for reforms. By the way, this is what I said uh, to the president, and this is what I said to the audience, as uh, Shigeo would vouch uh, uh, this morning. Uh, and I will talk about three areas where reforms can make a big di difference. Uh, inclusion, private sector development, and climate change. But before I go there, I want to say a couple of words about the economic outlook, where we are headed, and how this region features uh, in that context. Uh, the world economy was recovering from the pandemic very rapidly. In 2021, global growth was 6.1%. And then on February 24th, a war started, and it threw cold water on this momentum uh, for growth. Uh, in 22, growth slowed down to 3.4%. This year, it went down to 2.8%. Uh, and uh, the, pr the prospects for the next years are kind of gloomy. What we see in uh, Central Asia is the same thing. Yes, growth here is higher, but not up to the potential the countries have. And the problem is that Central Asia, the Caucasus, we still have here the need to catch up, even with the emerging economies in Europe, like Poland, Hungary, my country. To catch up means that you have to step on the pedal and uh, uh, take a very um, serious look at two things. One, how do you navigate at the time of economic fragmentation? The world economy used to perform miracles by being integrated. And now this integration is uh, falling apart. How do you deal with this? How do you retain uh, diversification of the economy, trade, how do you expand the integration of Central Asia, of this part of the world? And secondly, how do you prioritize growth-enhancing uh, reforms? Uh, our team, uh, we, have, we have a paper. I was supposed to hold the paper in my hand, except that you guys didn't give it to me. So imagine I'm holding a paper. Uh, our team has, do you have a copy? Okay, so 
I will hold the paper. Um, so we, what, we, what, what is important in this paper is uh, uh, the, what is the main message. Main message is structural inf ref uh, reforms are. Okay. I promise this. Here it is. Um, structural reforms in this region can add between 6 and 7% of GDP on an annual basis. This is a massive injection in prosperity for people in this region. And obviously one that should be pursued. So how do we propose that you prioritize, that these reforms are prioritized? Uh, first, very important for any country, but particularly important for economies still catching up, invest in people, in you. This is the best investment governments can make because ability to adjust to a changing structure of the world economy relies on the adaptability of people, of your skills, your ability to learn to learn. And that is new. In my days, when I was your age, we had to just learn. And then we realized that, that actually with this rapid change, what you learn, yeah, good. But your ability to adjust, to develop further, to step forward as uh, uh, opportunities arise, uh, to be the captain of your own destiny. Uh, this matters to you, it also matters to your community and your country. And what we particularly want to see is that people are confident that if there are hiccups, if things go wrong, if there is an exogenous shock, there would be a social protection system in place so if you need time to adjust, this time is provided to you. And that it is oriented not towards just satisfy, satisfying basic needs, but creating a mindset of self-reliance. In other words, it is to seek for this other opportunity that you will pursue. Uh, we, can, we can look at uh, the delivery of basic services as social protection. And we look at the uh, at programs that provide incentives to people to join the labor force rather than to stay home as social protection, uh, as counter-cyclical buffer uh, that makes it easier to eliminate these parts of the economy that are no more delivering competitive strength and have the possibility to shift uh, to where the prospects are best. Uh, we tell governments, you have to use your limited fiscal space smartly. There isn't that much of it, so deploying it to support those who need that support the most and thinking of how you insensitize inclusive uh, uh, society, that is what you should do with this uh, money. Uh, we secondly would like to see uh, opportunities for growth in a way that has been serving well for a while and then it got a bit on the back burner and it is private sector led growth. We see in Central Asia, it's not just in Kazakhstan, the same is in Uzbekistan, the same uh, is el elsewhere. We see the state doing things that it is not the best to do. There is room to step back. It would save money and it would increase opportunities and competitiveness. It would attract more financing domestically and from uh, overseas. Uh, we have seen uh, confidence in that role of the private sector significantly boosted when 
structures are in place to make it easy to be an entrepreneur. Uh, in Georgia, uh, for example, a country that uh, 20 years ago decided to take this uh, way, uh, there is now a public service hall. 450 public services are under one roof. You want to do something, it's easy for you to go get it, get it done. Uh, the third area I want to talk about is climate. Uh, for the young people here, I want to start, start by saying on behalf of my generation, I apologize to you because we messed it up. We have not acted when we knew that action is necessary. And you are those that are going to bear the brunt of the uh, climate crisis. But we are not hopeless. We still can both accelerate a transition to a low, low carbon economy and also protect our future with more competitive industries that, than those that we have relied on. Um, in uh, Uzbekistan, or we go around, 320 days sunshine, very few solar panels on roofs. Uh, and I, I don't have a, that good of an image from Kazakhstan, but from what I have seen, kind of the same. Why are we wasting free energy? Uh, why are we allowing uh, Belgium and Germany that are not the sunshine uh, places on this planet to outperform in solar? Uh, I also want to, to stress that in this part of the world, of course, uh, the issue that is top of mind when we talk about climate is water. And so there, the only way forward is for the Central and Asian countries to work together. Together, you can, you can buffer yourself against what could be a dramatic uh, water crisis. Uh, my last point before we, we move to get uh, to, uh, to question time is uh, to, uh, well, and, uh, and, and by the way, on, on green jobs, we did some research um, Comparison between brown jobs, green jobs. Green jobs pay much better. So if we want to have <laughs> good livelihoods, go green. Uh, I want to say just a word about our commitment, the IMF's commitment to this region. Uh, we have been here from the early 90s. Uh, we have accompanied governments with tough uh, reforms, during, during COVID, we immediately stepped up to provide emergency financing to the uh, low-income countries in the region, 800 million financing, uh, emergency financing and augmentation of programs. We have uh, distributed $650 billion equivalent of special drawing rights. This is the magic we have at the fund. Uh, on the strength of our members, we can create reserve assets and distribute it to the membership. Uh, this region, of course, uh, uh, received uh, its, uh, its share of special drawing rights, uh, about $4 billion equivalent. But the most important thing we do is to be the uh, family doctor. We are the only institution that holds a hand on the pulse of each and every economy among our membership, 190 of them, from the biggest, from the United States to the smallest. Uh, and the, the uh, smallest now is the country of Andorra and everybody in between. This is huge global public good because it allows countries to learn from each other, to identify directions to travel, and to take the right uh, policies. Uh, I am extremely proud, uh, Shigeo, to have crossed the uh, street, as you said, and uh, uh, be the managing director of the IMF at this particularly challenging time. 
it helps me that I was crisis commissioner. Uh, and boy, do we have crisis these days. Uh, I, uh, my colleagues, I love, I love to learn from uh, different cultures and uh, I love to quote uh, those smarter than me. So my colleagues gave me a great quote from Abai. True summer heat and winter cold, you stood firm, your spirit bold. The days ahead of us require this firm standing and bold spirit. And I wish all of you, especially those who are graduating, go with it. Thank you. Thank you, Kristalina. And uh, in a way, we've got already uh, two days before graduation, our first special graduation speech. So I think whoever is going to speak on Saturday has gotten the, word, the, the work cut out. So thank you, Kristalina. Um, listening to your, uh, and obviously the, the report's recommendation, and as you rightly said, um, this region is obviously not immune to the crisis. It's actually, we live in a region which is surrounded by lots of crisis. Uh, Afghanistan to the south, as we also mentioned, you know, there's violence. We, the war in Ukraine, unfortunately, it's not that far away. And China is not decided how it's going to come out of the COVID crisis, and growth seems to be underperforming. Iran is still locked into a, both an internal but also external crisis in terms of, of uh, um, dealing with uh, the Western countries and so on and so on. So obviously one recipe to, for all the countries is, okay, you have to weather it together. Individually, you may be too small, it's okay. But, um, it's easy said than done. And within the CCA countries, we also have a differentiation. In Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, to a certain lesser extent maybe, uh, Turkmenistan, and then to a lesser extent Uzbekistan, actually pretty much carbon economies. Um, and then you have the smaller ones like Kyrgyz, Tajikistan. How do you really foster regional cooperation and integration when, you know, the incentives for each of them are quite different still. Well, the uh, first thing I want to say is that uh, over the last um, years, there has been a tangible improvement in relations among countries. What is the driver of this improvement? Political will. Uh, Remember when, oh well, you're so young, you don't remember, but <laughs> there, were, there were mines on the border between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Uh, there were skirmishes, people, Uzbek people running from uh, Kyrgyzstan into Uzbekistan because of persecution. There were fights, not verbal, physical fights over water. Uh, and this is now kind of history. It's not, not happening uh, anymore. The two, uh, I, I, have, I have looked into these uh, developments um, uh, first with great concern because uh, uh, a, you know, war over water is not entirely out of the question in, in this part of the world. My two, two conclusions as to what can be done. The first one is, uh, uh, definitely a uh, jo joint investments in what matters the most for the region, and it is water. Water for irrigation, water for drinking, water for electricity. And the more countries can come up with public-private partnerships that align interests and make it so that this interconnectivity translates in economic uh, interdependence, the better. Uh, the second, you said the regions mostly, Kazakhstan is very clear example, 
uh, relies on hydro hydrocarbon. This is the source of wealth. It's not going to be forever. And uh, diversifying away from fossil fuels is just a necessity. Uh, I, I would give you one example as to how important it is. Gulf countries. The Gulf countries have chosen diversification away from fossil fuels in a very categorical manner. One simple illustration. Uh, this year, growth in the Gulf is 2.9%. Growth of non-oil and gas sectors is 4.2%. That shift uh, is something that countries here have to do. And uh, uh, luckily, uh, plenty of potential <laughs> to diversify. Um, is it, is it uh, uh, something that is going to happen? Yes. And I actually believe it would be the young people here who would drive it. Because your future depends on a world that puts itself on a more sustainable path than it is uh, today. So speak loud. Speak clear. Don't let the politicians off the hook. Thank you. I think uh, this is music to our ears, I guess, no? Now, um, I was amiss to, uh, in mentioning, or I forgot to mention that actually our conversation, our dialogue is live streamed through the IMF uh, network. Um, so you all, if you speak up and if the microphone comes to you, or you, please do come to the microphones, introduce yourselves, and you have an opportunity to be the focus of a global audience. Okay. <laughs> so don't be shy. Um, start to formulate your questions. Well, there is one already. All right. Okay. There. Please do come Mike. to the come to the microphone. Just say also who you are. And <laughs> All right. Can you hear me well? Yeah, just speak yes. loud. Just speak okay. loud. Mm -hmm. um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Ms. Georgia, for such an um, amazing speech and that you touched the topic of environment here, um, considering that economic development is a priority for Kazakhstan and the entire Central Asian and Caucasus region. Uh, you said that there's a lot of resource in form of wind and sun in Central Asia. Mm -hmm. However, this economic diversification requires substantial financing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask how Kazakhstan and other Central Asian countries can effectively mobilize capital mm -hmm. for non-oil sectors, mm -hmm. considering a lot of risks and uncertainties associated with transitioning away from mm -hmm. oil uh, that has been safe for many mm -hmm. decades for countries in the region. Thank you. Could you also introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. My name is Aida. Uh, I'm a fourth year graduating student from political science and international relations at Tokyo. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your question. Um, so, first thing first, to insensitize investments in non oil, non gas, in the energy transition or in other aspects of the green economy, you have to cost and price the hydrocarbons correctly. What does it mean? It means that there should be no subsidies and that the environmental cost they cause should be integrated. At the IMF, we advocate very strongly for pricing carbon as an incentive to consumers and to producers to move away from hydrocarbon to clean technologies. Where are we today? We are in a very sad place. Uh, carbon emissions, only 25% of carbon emissions are being priced. In other words, tax, carbon trade, or regulatory instruments that put a price de facto 
don't cover most of the emissions. And the price per ton average for the world is only $5. Our analysis says if we want to accelerate the green transition, carbon price in any of these forms by 2030 should be at least $75 a ton. Once you have that incentive, then the comparative cost of green investment, of course, goes down. And then you're right to say, how can we create more uh, incentive for investments to come? Well, uh, plain vanilla investment climate. Eliminate everything that is on the way of investors. Uh, in other words, send the signal that this is long-term policy and uh, put in place the uh, instruments, for example, getting the financial system to be tuned to provide loans that can be uh, sweetened with some government help to households so they can actually participate in a scheme of putting solar on every roof or uh, to create uh, the windmills product, uh, wind energy production on a scale uh, by buying, saying to the producer, we are going to buy your energy for the next 20 years. So there are ways in which projects that today look like they're not viable, they can be made viable. And this is being done in many countries. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I do believe that the uh, opportunity to then diversify also into the production of solar panels, the production of, of uh, uh, wind uh, uh, turbines. Uh, in Central Asia, you can unite and say we are going to be uh, putting our collective demand for green energy on the table. So investors see not Kazakhstan separately, Uzbekistan separately, Kyrgyzstan separately, but they see the whole uh, region as a very attractive uh, destination. Uh, going back to the uh, uh, question, uh, Shigeo's question, uh, if governments in the region harmonize their standards, their requirements, and they integrate their market, especially for, uh, for energy, that can be a total game uh, changer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question or comment? Yes, please, come to the microphone. Uh, yeah, uh, Madam Director, welcome in, in Kazakhstan and Astana. Uh, my name is Magjan Kormashov. I'm a second year master's student in the political science department and uh, I'd like to thank you very much for honoring us and all the graduating this year cohort with your visit and magnificent lecture. Uh, actually, my question is related to the previous one about this green transitioning in Central Asia. Uh, I'd like to begin with the claim that actually this green transition is very costly project and not even the advanced economies can afford the full transition while the Central Asian region is not as rich as we would like to and the household incomes are pretty low compared to world average. And if your uh, proposal of the green, green transitioning will come true, don't you think that majority of the Central Asian households would not, uh, will not be able to bear the costs of this green transitioning. It will create any, like, some financial and social instability and maybe uh, disintegrate the regional cooperation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this question. And uh, I am going to respectfully disagree, <laughs> big time. So we have run. Uh, uh, this, uh, you know, this notion that the green transition is unaffordable, uh, completely wrong. We actually run uh, models to see what is the cost. Yes, in the first years of transition, when you have to make more investment, there is a slightly higher cost. But over time, when you get economy, of scale, costs drop down. And the sooner you start, the cheaper it is over the long uh, run. When we compare, I'll, I'll give you an example with solar. Solar, yes, used to be more expensive than coal-produced uh, energy. 
once the scale of production of solar panels got to that point that the cost per panel dropped dramatically, it became cheaper to have solar energy than to have uh, fossil fuel, uh, fuel produced energy. Of course, you're right, in the beginning, before you get to this scale, it is more expensive. You experiment, you make mistakes, you have to correct these mistakes. But luckily for you, for Kazakhstan, for Uzbekistan, on solar, the job is done by others. You only rip off the uh, uh, benefits of scale. Uh, similarly with wind, these are two technologies, commercially viable, very competitive. Of course, for both, you need what? You need sun and you need wind. As long as you have them, it is not more expensive. Uh, my uh, second point, there are technologies that are still more expensive. And obviously, we have to go that way. Uh, where I see no excuse whatsoever is in these two technologies that are commercially viable and actually cheaper than fossil fuel energy. Uh, so, uh, and to go back to your, to your uh, point about people being affected. Uh, this is where the government steps forward. This is why I talked in my, in my um, presentation about social protection. In this period of time when the economy is adjusting and people are adjusting, yes, the government should help. But the government right now is helping big time subsidizing uh, fossil fuels, which are the cause of climate change in a region where temperatures here are accelerating faster than the rest of the world. Your president, president of, uh, uh, of uh, Kazakhstan spoke about two and a half times faster possibly increase in uh, average temperatures. So what do we want to put a huge burden on people not in some faraway future in the years to come or take on this transition, be part of it. I also heard arguments that are not, not deprived of logic that these countries historically have contributed very little to emissions. So therefore, somebody else has to do the job. Problem is that if Japan, where Mr. Katsu comes from, if Japan goes to zero, and then the United States goes to zero, and then Europe goes to zero, but the emerging markets continue increasing emissions, it doesn't matter what they do. We are all cooked. And uh, boy, would that be painful here. You would have winters that are much colder, <laughs> and summers that are much hotter. So choice we have to make collectively is, do we want to have a livable planet? Or we think that having a livable planet is not affordable. Thank you. Uh, let me just add also that we also have to take into account the public health dimensions of you know, coal, fire, energy, the negative externalities, you know, in villages and owls and so, very often we have, in, in particular in winter, respiratory mm -hmm. diseases. Yep, big time. So, yeah. yep. so if you really try to catch the real cost of a fossil dependent economy, it's much, much bigger than people think. Uh, and, and again, to be fair to, to the question, uh, coal is the worst Oil is next. Gas is a transitional fuel. It is less, less uh, damaging in terms of uh, emissions. So also the transition doesn't have to be from fossil to, to only renewables. There is a this is why it is called transition, because it would take some time. And there are steps that can be followed that allow economies that are rich on oil and gas uh, resources to transition in a in a, a kind of bearable manner without too heavy burden on its people. 
you take this? Can we agree on this or we have to, to do a second round? I, I look at you and you're not nodding, so. <laughs> Well, let's entertain, see whether others come up with questions. If not, you can continue. But there, yes, there is a, yes, please. Uh, could you could use a microphone so that uh, mm -hmm. you know our our live audience around the world can listen to you? Or you can also come down to the microphone. Eh? Thank you for your speech today. <coughs> My question is about nuclear power plant that is going to build in Kazakhstan, uh, which is being discussed very uh, actively now. Mm -hmm. And what is the reaction of I IMF in this case, and what are your recommendations? Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Mulder. I'm a graduate student in GSC, uh, Graduate School of Education. Uh, we don't have engineering expertise. We don't have, at the IMF, we don't have uh, the skills to judge for or against technologies. We look at the cost structure, and in that sense, nuclear energy is very competitive. If you are imagining that the world moves on carbon price, the fossil fuel energy will be much more expensive because you need to factor in carbon as well as particulates pollution, the health impact. Nuclear would be more competitive. With nuclear energy, there are, as we all know, two problems. The first one is safety, and the second one is nuclear waste. There are now uh, quite advanced production methods for micronuclear, for small nuclear, that is obviously much safer. And there has been quite a, an investment into how to store nuclear waste safely. But these are considerations, and each country has to take those uh, into account. So as you make this decision in, uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, there are pros, there are also some risks, they have to be assessed and uh, uh, decision taken. Uh, the, the World Bank, that where we worked, uh, it was a very interesting story. The World Bank had only one topic, only one issue that it would not engage, would not invest, would not engage, and that was nuclear. Any other questions? Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Georgiou, dear attendees. It's my pleasure to meet you here. I'll, I'll just stand like this, if you don't mind. So my name is Alpomus Asabayev. I'm a proud alumnus of this uh, gracious university, the Nazarbayev University, and we are really glad to meet you here today. And uh, my question is pretty ordinary. Uh, Ms. Georgieva, imagine you are head of the country, which is somewhere in between the two great powers, China and uh, Russia. You have very, very cheap uh, coal. Mm -hmm. You have very cheap oil and gas and other natural resources. And uh, the cost of living is not so high, but uh, you know the incomes of the people is not so high as well. You are in a quite fragile political and social economical situation. You are one of your friends and so-called allies is uh, seem not to be so friendly to you anymore due yeah. in the light of recent events and you don't know what to expect from him and uh, allies from the far far away from the seven seas uh, is like coming but it's not really coming because you know if they come there will be another big uh, I mean like a theater and drama coming on in this country you don't want to do this and uh, you already owe a lot of money to, our, to your big dragon friend I mean like your big dragon uh, neighbor yeah. and um, uh, the people from the Europe, they're very nice, they're very intelligent, they have a good education. They come and say, like, you have to be transitioning to the green economy. But we were doing the coal stuff like 80 years ago and even less than that. But you have to do it now. Because of what? Uh, because, if, uh, because the world is changing and we will be like baking in this place. 
And uh, you know, if you will start transitioning right now, I mean, because it requires political will and all this stuff, the uh, cost for the utilities, uh, as, I mean, like the ordinary people, uh, uh, they see things uh, as a, in their ordinary life, like, uh, will skyrocket. This in turn will be very social uh, thing, socio-economical thing, like uh, turmoil or something like that, or at least some kind of tensions. And uh, in turn, it will be become a very political issue. And tomorrow, between, uh, in front of the White House of the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, you'll see thousands of people chanting things about the President. You won't uh, want to hear about uh, his politics and, and all that stuff. In this case, what would you do? <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, of course, there is economics. And, uh, Maya, please interrupt you. And the second thing is, we also want to switch to the green economy because we don't want to inhale the dirty air because we have kids and brothers and sisters and all this stuff. But those lithium ion batteries, they degrade for the hundreds of years and they even more corrupt our land, which is already a bit of corrupted thanks to the nuclear testing sites, uh, remnants of the Soviet. Uh, uh, heritage. So. Yeah. Uh, so, you asked me what I would do. Of course, uh, decisions are taken not just on the straightforward economics. There, there is political economy. You have to see where you are. How you prepare people. How you actually tell them the truth, <laughs> which is a little different from the way uh, you just rep uh, presented it. Uh, and how long do you take for that? Uh, let, me, let me say I am very sympathetic to Kazakhstan between the dragon and the bear. Uh, my uh, uh, simple observation, and actually I shared that with your president, is what do you do when you have a dragon and a bear? Well, befriend and be aware. Befriend to the extent you can, you build relations, you feed the dragon, you kind of feed the bear, but also be aware of what may happen to you. Um, I know the bear very well. What do we know about bears? Bears sleep half of the year, then they wake up and mess up the neighborhood. <laughs> so uh, obviously you have to navigate understanding that context. Uh, what I want to, to, to say, because clearly this is something that would require uh, hours of discussion, not just uh, the minutes we have. You're absolutely right to be angry with the rich world that has been on this road to hell when they didn't know, you can excuse it, you can say, well, you didn't know. But since the 90s, we know, and yet very slow to act on what we know. And this is why when I spoke to you, I apologize. I do feel personally guilty that we have not done the right thing for you. I have a daughter and two grandchildren. In 2018, I read the report of the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that basically said we are for a bad right. The future, the future of my grandchildren is not so fantastic. When she's 40, the migration caused by climate change would put, push hundreds of millions of people out of their homes. Uh, and if she's uh, uh, as lucky as uh, Queen Elizabeth to live to her age, uh, our planet may not be livable. We may not be able to, we, we may have to live underneath or in some kind of uh, uh, structures and there would be, believe you me, much fewer of us unless we act. And my appeal to you is to think about action not as evil but actually as an opportunity because Economies will transform. Some will transform faster than others. And those that transform faster will be more competitive. They will be the producers of the new technology. Why do you want not to be among them? The reason I talked about the Gulf is because the Gulf is acting very smartly. 
Who are the, bigger, the biggest producers of renewable energy? <laughs> they come from Emirates, now Saudi Arabia. Why are these economies moving their money that they earn from oil and gas into not uh, oil and gas? For a very good reason, because these are the sectors that are going to go down and they would be sectors they invest in those that are going to be going up. So, yes, it is, it is morally right to say we are paying a price for somebody else's inaction. Yes, it is right for you to demand concessional finance and grants that come from the rich world to emerging markets and developing economies. And by the way, at the IMF, we created just uh, a year ago a new concessional lending instrument exactly to support this transition. Never the IMF landed money on long term. Now we have 20 year, 10 and a half grace, low interest rates financing because it is right. It is the right thing to do. But do not, do not fall in this complacency Oh, well, we haven't done it, therefore we don't have to do a thing. Because you haven't done it, it's going to hit you. You haven't done it, others are transforming. To <laughs> do what is right for you. Uh, and I am, I mean, I come from an, from an emerging uh, market economy. I, I come from transition economy. My country has lignite. You guys have at least oil and gas. But in my heart of heart, I don't want my country to be on the end of, in the, end of, the, uh, of the queue when it comes down to competitiveness and new technology. I want them to be ahead. And, and I want the same for you, not because I'm some kind of brainwashed European. Yes, I was in the European, European commissioner, but I'm a Bulgarian. <laughs> That's where I come from. I want it for us for our economies to be ahead and not to be in, you know, breathe the dust of those who were smarter than us to move faster. That's okay? That's great. Thank you. Maybe I should just add, and that's why we have universities to do research. <laughs> okay. Yes, any, any <laughs> other questions? You know what I'm observing? Usually when I'm with a group of young people, they always ask me, how did I become a managing director? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm kind of waiting for this question. How did you do it? <laughs> well, if nobody asks, I will ask it at the end. <laughs> uh, good day. Um, uh, Manager and Director, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, yeah. Mr. Shkirkatsi. Can, can you speak up a little uh, bit Yeah, um, uh, welcome to Nazarbayev University, uh, Ms. Kristalina Georgieva and uh, Mr. Shkirkatsi. Uh, my name is Aizhan, I am a teaching assistant at NU uh, Graduate School of Business. Uh, you mentioned about structural reforms and uh, there are also many reports and papers written about uh, more representative government in Kazakhstan. What are the views and what are the actually uh, actions towards, what, what are the views from the IMF about structural reforms and more representative government in Kazakhstan, especially uh, during the inflationary pressures, about like 16.5% high interest rates, about January events. Uh, what do you think about uh, the structural reforms coming mm -hmm. and the representative government? Uh, so the, uh the term structural reform uh, very often is interpreted differently. People put different contexts uh, in it. What actually it is, uh, is to move your economy towards the future and improve the effectiveness and efficiency with which it works. Uh, and when you look at what are the key areas of structural reform that are necessary uh, today. Well, the first one is to get skills and capabilities up and tuned towards 
jobs that we don't even know will exist. In other words, cr create the, the uh, learning and innovation environment uh, that this university is also working uh, towards. Uh, second, to get the functioning of public services well-funded and well-targeted. Well-funded meaning you need tax revenues that are fair, fairly uh, taxes that are fairly uh, placed and that are collected. And here, the way we do that, and we work a lot on this, is to help countries digitalize their tax systems and also to look into easy to collect, easy to, to operate with uh, taxes. And then when you have these revenues, your next uh, area is how you make the public spending as efficient as possible. Uh, and there we do, we, at the fund we have an instrument called public investment management assessment that looks into what is the public money best suited to do, where there are inefficiencies, how they can be eliminated. And then you look at where you, do you, how do you want to help your economy move faster, diversify more. And their key structural reforms are in the area of trade, how you, how you create conditions for uh, inclusion in global value chains and in expanding diversify, diversifying uh, trade. Uh, and what signals do you take from uh, global data to inform your decisions? How does that play vis-a-vis -vis the comparative strength of your country, of your economy? Uh, and of course, a very, very important area uh, of uh, structural reforms is in making the, uh, the business climate conducive for more people to be willing to put their money into the country. Both local, by the way, local investors matter a lot, as well as foreign investors. At the fund, we, you mentioned inflation. We work a lot on monetary policy. Why? Because money is the, the fuel of the engine of the economy. And how money functions matters tremendously. Uh, when the banking system, and that's another area where reforms are very often help, when the banking system is tuned to insensitize savings and investments, and when the money supply and the goods in circulation are in, in balance, there is no inflation, then it creates predictability. When there is inflation, you have no clue. Should you invest? Should you buy like uh, today? Or maybe you buy three things today because tomorrow they may be more expensive. Uh, so your whole concept of, of investment and consumption is impacted uh, by that. And this is why refor the reforming monetary policy, uh, banking supervision, the ability to, to guarantee sound financial financials of a country also matters. So there are different areas where, ref and every country has to say, OK, let me look at me. Where am I good? Where I'm not so good? How do you do that? You use comparators, you use institutions like the fund. We give you a mirror, you look at the mirror and say, okay, you know, my hair, need, I need a haircut. Uh, so that is, that is the, the logic of reforms. Very peop many people think that when we say structural reforms, we mean making things more expensive for people, taking away subsidies. Sometimes, yes, reducing subsidies matters. Why? Because Sometimes subsidies are really dumb. You give money to rich people. You take from poor people taxes to subsidize rich people by, for example, keeping uh, gasoline prices low. Uh, 
So that's why that's why this is so it is important, but but it is always it always has to be done with the heart. Who do we affect? How do we make sure that we don't hurt those in society that are most vulnerable? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I may just add, I think in your question you wanted also to refer to how do you make uh, a government or more respond to the citizens. Oh, I didn't hear. Make Sorry, it more. I, I think that's what you meant. Also, making government to be more representative or to be responsive. No, mm -hmm. and I think this is where obviously international organizations are not going to prescribe what form of government you know ought to be the most applicable one, the best one for any given country. But one thing that international development practitioners have learned over time is you can only in sort of prescribe and recommendation, uh, recommend these various structural reforms, but it has to be the citizens themselves in the end. To demand it, yeah. You have to demand, mm -hmm. you have to own these. And, and actually, engagement and, and, and good communication helps tremendously. Uh, and yes, I agree with Chigeo. Um, you can take a horse to water, cannot make the horse drink. Okay, one more question over there. Can, why don't you come down here? Uh, I think they'll bring a oh. mic. You have a microphone there? Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Krasuna Georgieva and uh, Professor Hugo Katsu for organizing this event. Uh, my name is Adelia. I am a graduating student from Political Science and International Relations. Um, first of all, I just want to really say that um, I'm so happy, excited to be here. Um, like It really feels like I'm just entering the university again uh, for opportunity to see you, uh, to listen to you. I remember just uh, four years ago, I was reading your Wikipedia page and uh, like reading who are you and uh, <laughs> being so excited about uh, like, I know it's 2023, but it is still a problem seeing female leadership in such a big organizations. So I was very excited and insp inspired. Um, and I, it re it's really unbelievable that I'm now sitting here and listening to you and, uh, face to face. So I have two questions. Um, first of all is, uh, I have heard a lot about, uh, I think in the literature there is a lot of criticism about IMF's work uh, that, uh, for example, one of the like uh, distinguished books is by uh, Joseph Stiglitz. Mm -hmm. He wrote in, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, late 90s or early 2000s about uh, IMF's one size fits all and uh, uh, solutions and, uh, and there's a lot of similar literature and uh, obviously, Leadership, had, it was in the past, it, uh, some time has passed, and uh, leadership has changed a lot, but I just want to hear about, and I also haven't been really keeping up, unfortunately, about what is happening now, what actually is uh, IMF doing in that response, but I want to hear, um, mm -hmm. most of all, uh, your personal opinion on that criticism. What do you think, uh, do you feel like in the past it was justified that IMF was in fact acting like that in those, uh, uh, in those way? Um, so what do you think personally about that? Did you consider that when you were transitioning from World Bank to IMF? And the second question is the question I think um, I and a lot of other students want to ask is in fact, indeed, how did you become a managing director? <laughs> um, like a, just graduating student, uh, it's very exciting but also scary um, to be a, you know, in this changing economy. So what advice would you give? Um, I've heard a lot of uh, inspiring words from you about uh, firm step and the bold spirit. Uh, in those ways, uh, how could you, what would you, maybe even more uh, also inspiration but also practical advice, what should we be doing? Mm -hmm. What would you suggest? Thank you. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for the uh, questions. Uh, uh, Joe Stiglitz and, and I, and actually Shige, we were colleagues at the World Bank at the time when he criticized the IMF. And I have read, of course, many of the um, uh, researchers' uh, work uh, on that uh, front. And what I can say is that, uh, uh, like 
every organization, the IMF, has built experience and learned from it. Uh, it is true that there was a period of time when uh, uh, the thinking in the IMF was uh, not wrongly, by the way, but more narrowly focused uh, on key macroeconomic indicators. And offering recommendations how to get to macroeconomic and financial stability without enough consideration of the impacts that could, that could have on different parts of the uh, population. Uh, I give credit to my predecessor, another woman, Christine Lagarde. Uh, in 2018, under her leadership, the IMF uh, adopted a policy on social spending, establishing social spending floors in IMF programs, exactly for the reason to make sure that the economy benefits, but that these benefits are shared more fairly and not uh, cost being borne uh, by, by the uh, more vulnerable people uh, in society. Uh, I would say the IMF often has to step in when a country has created a kind of a policy mess. We are called when countries find themselves in, in a tough spot, uh, often because of lax uh, policies, uh, fiscal policy that is not affordable. In other words, you spend much more than you can possibly afford. Then you borrow money, then this gets as a burden on you. And then what do you do? You say, oh, well, I have a central bank that can print money and I'll be fine. And then the central bank prints money and then there is inflation. My own country, Bulgaria, went through hyperinflation exactly because of bad policies. And when you, are, when, when you ruin your economy, guess what? You know, your family doctor comes and has to prescribe uh, medicine. Uh, and sometimes it is not the sweetest of medicine. What we recognize now, and I, and I take pride of, of my team, of my colleagues, is that we have to think more comprehensively about the well-being of nations. And uh, we, we can only be successful and resilient to the shocks that are hitting us if we have resilient people that are educated, healthy, with good social protection, that the society is resilient, not just the banking sector, not just the economy, that there is a sense of fairness in society that makes people pull together at the time of uh, difficulty. And of course, that our planet is resilient because this is where our lives uh, uh, need to uh, go on. And that more comprehensive view at the fund is reflected now in what we look at in countries. We, we don't just check um, the very basic science, um, you know, uh, growth, inflation, deficit. We look more comprehensively uh, how, how the economy functions. We now have a climate strategy. In, in other words, we look at the climate dimensions of, of growth. So for growth to be sustainable, it has to be fair, it has to be inclusive, uh, it, has to, it has to have the dynamism that comes with opportunities being available uh, to, uh, to all. Uh, and I want to say that uh, my country, when the IMF came uh, to Bulgaria, it rescued us from a horrible situation. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it has demonstrated the difference between bad policy and good policy. It was painful. And now when I look back, I wished that Christine Lagarde was uh, uh, my predecessor in the 90s, so there would be a social safety uh, net for, for the most vulnerable Bulgarians. But it was very effective. It put the country uh, on the right uh, track. Uh, I remember, I, I have said that to many, many audiences, uh, it was so bad, I would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to queue to buy milk for my daughter. 
in an agricultural economy with good agriculture, no milk. Uh, so that is, in other words, uh, the, the IMF has a job to do. This job does require sometimes, you know, speak truth to power and, 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 and recommend things that are not easy to bring a country on a sound uh, uh, footing. But yes, uh, Joe Stiglitz was right then. He, by the way, came a couple of times to the fund, uh, uh, being very positive about the work we do because we have added this more understanding of it is more complex uh, and therefore it requires uh, more, uh, more thoughtful assessment and action. Uh, now, to the question I was looking for. So, <laughs> um, the, uh, the first thing, especially for young uh, women, is uh, uh, believe in yourself and radiate this confidence to others. Uh, and then swallow the fact that it takes hard work. Uh, those who would tell you, oh, you know, it's very easy and there are no sacrifices. Uh, if you are to get to, to the position I'm in, yeah, there are sacrifices. I miss birthdays of my daughter. I cannot tell you how many 18, 20 hours, days, work days I have had in my life. Uh, when the pandemic hit, I slept for months, no more than four hours, because we needed to come up with a response to something that has never happened before. So if you have that confidence and willingness to work hard, they are uh, fabulous uh, opportunities in this life. But then there is also the element of luck. And again, if somebody tells you, oh, luck, that's, this, is, this is for the birds. Uh, here is my, uh, my luck. I had three times in my life something that happened that changed dramatically the trajectory of where I was going. The first time was uh, in 1990, Bulgaria is just coming out of uh, communism. And I got an invitation from a professor to go and be visiting professor in the University of South Pacific in Fiji. Now, Shigeo, I had to run to the map and say, where is Fiji? And then I said, oh my goodness, it's on the other side of the world. How am I going to get from here to there? Uh, and my luck was that there was somebody who actually believed in me and funded my ticket because I, on my uh, Professorship salary in, in Bulgaria these days, my, my monthly income was $100, and the ticket was uh, $2,000. So, uh, so I ended up going to Fiji. Why is this uh, uh, relevant? Because it actually exposed me more internationally, and then later on I went to MIT. Uh, my, one of, of the uh, sweetest story in my, stories in my life is arriving in Fiji at the airport, the uh, a passport control gets my passport, and the woman types something, looks at me and says, where are you from? I said, Bulgaria. She types again and says, there is no such country. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I, I, I happen to be the first Bulgarian in Fiji. They didn't have the Bulgarian thing in their system. Uh, but that, that was luck, you know, the fact that he invited me, the fact that he knew me, that he invited me, that I've, I had this sponsor who got me there. Second piece of luck was the bank. So I'm at MIT. I got an invitation uh, from uh, uh, a friend at the bank to go and give a talk. And uh, I thought I did. <laughs> and again, this is lessons for you, for young people. Always absorb the environment. I walked at the bank. I had a jacket. I love colors. I mean, this time I'm not that colorful, but I love colors. So I had a jacket with, with big flowers on, on it. I looked around. I walked out and went and bought a dark blue suit so I can fit in this place. <laughs> True story, I got an invitation to work at the bank. So for the summer, I went for the summer. I'm sitting in my office uh, as a consultant, which at the bank is like the lowest 
think. Um, and my phone rings, and some woman says, can you please come to Mr. So-and-so office tomorrow at 4? I looked at my calendar and said, no, I can't. She almost dropped dead on the other side of the line because I'm, you know, this lowly consultant refusing. So I went, and the moment I started talking with so-and-so, uh, they were actually interviewing me. So how did it happen that I got a job offer? Well, 92, the bank committed to hire 100 environmentalists. The bank was moving into Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union, needed Russian speakers. And it was a very pathetic situation in terms of women. They needed more women. So here is this woman, check, 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 <laughs> luck. Uh, and uh, the third, third uh, time when, when my, my trajectory changed uh, uh, dramatically uh, was uh, when I went to the European Commission as, a, as, the, as the Bulgarian commissioner. Uh, Shigeo may not know this part. Uh, I, I was um, the Bulgarian nominee for commissioner failed to pass the parliamentarian hearing. That was a huge embarrassment for my nation. So, three o'clock in the morning, my phone in Washington rings, the Bulgarian prime minister on the other side saying, Kristalina, we are in deep trouble. We need our biggest gun. I felt very proud to be the, the biggest gun. Uh, so, in, uh, in, uh, in this one hour, my, my, I changed continents, I changed jobs. Why was that luck? Because as a crisis commissioner, this prepared me more than my economics training for being a managing director at the time of COVID, of war, at the time when the work is, world is being uh, shocked. Bottom line, you need, to work, you need to work hard, believe in yourself, and don't miss on these windows of opportunities. When it opens, don't sit there saying, oh, should I go, should I not go? And one day, you will be the managing director of the IMF. Thank you, Kristalina. I think a great message, especially to our uh, female students. You know, please take it to heart, and I'm going to quiz you on Saturday. <laughs> All right. Let's give another big hand. Thank you. Have a fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think the idea is to take a group photo together, so I suggest that all of you who sit on the sides just move more towards the center. Uh -huh. Yes, then we do. And then we can, we can do a nice okay. group photo with them. Great. Right. Yeah.